I spent about $500 on Amazon trying to find some of the cheapest welding tools I could find. Let's see if they're worth a damn or if I just bought a bunch of junk. I've been against cheap auto dark hoods for quite some time. You gotta at least spend a hundred bucks minimum in order to get something quality. You can go check out this older video that we did on kind of the ins and outs in welding hoods. And we actually use this one as an example, this welding helmet, auto darkening, best club, true color, solar powered hood with adjustable shade range. I mean, it's 30 bucks. What do you've got to lose to try it out? And you know, I try not to forget where I came from. This is something that I started out with, not quite this brand or this model, but I started off with a cheap auto dark hood myself. Myself. It's gonna go dark and it's gonna weld and you can get by with it, but really how long is it going to last? And is it up to the task like some other welding processes like low amperage TIG where typically these cheaper hoods like to flash a lot on you. The Amazon post is absolutely hilarious. If you go start clicking on the pictures here, this like shade chart, it's super funny. It has MIG heavy, MIG light. Evidently with MIG light, you need a darker shade by the time you hit 300 amps. Gee whiz, they got the mag on there, so that's cool. SAW, you need a shade 10 through 15 for submerged arc welding. I don't know if you knew that. That's a joke. You don't need actually a hood at all to weld with submerged arc welding. And then you have plasma arc cutting, plasma arc welding. They actually said it's good for MIG, MMA, TIG, and plasma grinding. Very interesting. Never heard of plasma grinding personally. The headgear really isn't as bad as I thought it would be. Two points of contact for adjustability. The bad part about it, my eyes are still right here, which I think I think that's honestly not too bad. The nuts, I'm tightening them down really tight and they didn't strip. That's a good sign. Like, still wobbly even though they're all the way tight but you really don't want them that tight anyway. We got our different adjustabilities on there on the inside, like our sensitivity and our delay. And then of course you have your adjustable shade right here all the way from nine to your 13. And then it has your grind mode on there. All intents and purposes, this hood should be pretty solid. But if I crank down on that headgear on the back, I'm all the way cranked down and it won't get any tighter and it's just stripping back there. So I would be curious to see how long that lasted if you going back and forth and cranking on this little, this back piece of that headgear. We're gonna use this towards the end on the welding portion. We'll really get to see how it looks as far as through the hood and all that good jazz. Now I've got a touch of a vendetta against the next items and I didn't even have to buy them because I already had a set on my own. Little fabrication, 90 degree magnets. The idea is great. Like to be able to sit here and grab a piece of steel, put this magnet on there and then boom. 90 degrees, wrong. And it either hits below or it hits above. You have to slide it down and then it's just not going where it needs to. And then the off chance that you do get it exactly where you want it and you're like, perfect. And then you put a square on it and you're like, what the? Not only do they give you that false sense of security, but they also just gather just a whole bunch of junk on them. And if there's junk on the edge of that, then you gotta give it that old wipe and then you gotta dirty up your shirt or you get to handling it and you messing with it and then you get metal splinters in your hands. Absolute miserable tool to have. Use a classic square. Now these are a little bit better. These are your adjustable ones. You can see that it's not magnetic until I hit the switch. That switch on there, I would say adds a lot of help to it. You can get it right lined up, kind of squeezed up against the clamp and then you can activate it and now it's mostly square. But I definitely always double check it because you just never know if there's a little schmutz on there or it's just not holding it properly. I'm not a big fan of the fabrication magnets at all. I wouldn't waste your money. The switch ones are all right if you have to go that route. And as far as these little magnetic grounds, this is like the cheapest little one I found. I didn't realize how dinky it was. It's like not even strong enough to hold my cable on the table. <laughs> as you get things hotter, which welding always does, it gets a little hot and then it just stops working. Let's give it a shot. I'm gonna take a plate and I'm just gonna weld like crazy, gob some stuff up, just try to put some heat into it. Really not looking to put anything pretty on this plate. Really just trying to put some heat into that ground. The hood looks good, I'll be honest. I can see everything I need to see. I don't know how long we welded for, but it seemed to hold up pretty good. I hate to put my finger on it, but... Oh, I just barely touched that. That magnet is hot. Dude, it is not... It is not sticking. It's not sticking anymore. By God, that magnet's ruined. It's done for, toast, kaputs. Now there are magnetic grounds out there like this mag switch one. This is a 300 amp rated one. And even if it gets schmutz on the end of it, you can turn that magnet on and off. So it's on right now, really strong magnet off. You can get the crap off. You can, it's not magnetic anymore. So it's really nice to carry around if this is the route you wanna to go to. But remember, magnets are only good for grounding on ferrous metals. Stainless steels and your aluminum are kind of out of it. And I still remember a time with one of these 300 amp 
magnets where I used to pipe weld for a living. We were welding like 200 amps all day on some heavy wall pipe. And it, my arc just started sounding funny, started acting funny. I was like, I don't know what's going on. And I looked back at the ground. The ground had lost its magnetism and sat there and slid down the pipe like two foot, just arc striking down the whole piece of pipe. And I panicked. I was like, oh God, I need a file, some, a flap disc and some cold galve, like stat. Just keep that in mind when it comes to these magnets. I don't recommend any type of magnet without a switch and make sure they're rated to handle a bunch of heat. I'm honestly kind of excited about this next one. This, this little angle grinder. I love how they hold it in the picture. It's like a little kitty. Small angle grinder, but it's still got some heft to it. So I'll give it that. So it came with more stuff than most angle grinders I've ever bought. And this one was what? How much was this? This was $28 on Amazon. It's just a cute little angle grinder. It comes with a couple flap discs, a couple grinding discs, a couple cutoff wheels. It comes with both of the types of guards that you might would need with your type 27 or type one, whatever it may be. And I've never seen a grinder come with its own little set of brushes. And I only know what these are because I had to look in the manual to figure out what the heck they were. Not a brushless grinder, but it has brushes on the inside. So the fact that it comes with some replacement ones tells me that they know it's, it's about to get smoked. So that's what we're fitting to try to do. I'm gonna roll out some pipe here and we're just gonna bevel away. I'm gonna put some pressure. This abrasive is another thing that you don't wanna skip out on when it comes to grinding because I think we're about to just throw more grinding disc than metal around. Let's get to ripping. Well, I'm not gonna lie, I've been pretty aggressive on the angle on this disc, but I haven't even been able to hardly bevel the thing, and look at that. That is absolutely ruined. I'm just trying to bevel a piece of pipe. I do this all the time with quarter inch grinding discs, and that's probably how you'd be able to make this thing last longer, because you're gonna have to stop and change discs so often. We got a Cubitron 3 on there now. See how it holds up. I mean, that's at least what your abrasive is supposed to do. I mean, we put a bevel on that. You know, we've only just barely kind of worn out this Cubitron 3, and we've actually started to bevel it. Because I want to see this thing get hot, so we're going to keep grinding. I'll put my hand over the breather here. Oh, yeah, it smells real bad now. Oh, it's so smelly. My gloves are so hot. I about can't hold this freaking grinder anymore. We got a smoker. It's definitely not supposed to do that. We got this sucker sitting at a nice 212. They're pretty much smoked whenever they start smoking. For 30 bucks, that was a pretty rigorous test. I don't know too many of us that are buying $30 grinders that are trying to bevel Schedule 80 pipe. Compared to sit there trying to buy a, you know, $200 grinder or $150 grinder, you could buy four of these, burn them up, and then just get another one. Golly, that sucker's hot. Now back in the day in my old ag mechanics high school shop class, we had a chop saw for pretty much every fabrication project, but the budget for high schools isn't all that high. So pretty much anyone that starts off with a chop saw probably runs one of these abrasive chop saw discs. This guy right here was like, seven bucks. Now you can spend a whole lot more and get one like this. This one was like 135 bucks. I've been using it for quite some time now, so it's it's definitely seen some better days. It's still got a lot of life left. I think it's easier to just show you why one might be better than the other than to talk about it. All we've done is take some of this rusty two inch by two inch by eighth inch wall square tubing and we've given a cut. This metal blade is gonna cut faster. Point blank period, it's gonna cut faster. It's gonna make a cleaner cut. If you get all the way through, you're gonna notice a clear difference in the cut quality because you're gonna have a nasty burr with this chop saw blade. It happens every time you're not gonna get rid of that nasty bird. But if you get one of these, there's virtually none. It's December of this year, 2025. I bought it in November, 2024, and I've had it since. I think this one was a 14 inch blade. And after the one cut, we're at 13 and three quarters. So what are you gonna tell me? I can get like 50 
something, 50 something cuts for this blade. And I've known this blade's been cutting way over 100, maybe even 200, 300 cuts. It's still going. The best part about it is if you really need to do a little bit of trimming, because you've cut something a little too long and you need to take like a blade's width off, this is the worst thing you can ever try to do. Because all this thing tends to do is what I call walk, and it wants to move, it flexes. I can cut slivers with this metal chop saw blade. And for those reasons, that's why I'm willing to spend 10X the cost for something that I'm gonna use for a long time compared to this piece of junk. Oh, that was hard. Ugh. Oh, my knee. Now that disc was probably one of the cheaper items on our list. This is gonna be probably the most expensive item on our list at close to 200 bucks. We did a while back on the YouTube video where we took this table that markets itself as a fixture table, which is pretty laughable. We've gone and souped it up. We put a grinding disc rack on it, supports on the bottom, supports in the middle with a shelf for tool storage, for welder storage. We put wheels on that sucker. It should always have wheels. A couple hooks, MIG gun holder, a vise right here that we can piddle with and play on. Honestly, after doing all that, I love this table. It is pretty awesome. It's like kind of like a pair of boots you don't mind getting dirty. I'll push this thing out into the yard, do a bunch of grinding, bring multiple grinders out so that I can plug them in here. Now, when it comes to fixturing on it, that's what I'll say pretty much sucks. One, you have to take the bolt out, go underneath it, and screw it on, which is absolute trash. And then the other fixtures are just kind of tricky and a little dinky. For what it's worth though, this table will make its money back pretty quick if you go about doing some work. Now the next item on the list probably has one of the most radical price ranges that I've ever seen. And that's your budget tungsten sharpeners. This one right here is like 50 bucks that I found on Amazon. And you know, there's other ones like piranhas that are like 2000 bucks. And even some like wet grinding tungsten sharpeners. I know that sounds crazy, but they're like three grand. You may have never even heard of them before. I'll be honest, I've had one of these before. And I think I used it twice before I threw it out. Doesn't have enough holes, big enough holes for the 1 8 tungsten, so you can't even sharpen the eighth inch tungsten on here. I know I'm gonna catch some flack for saying this, it doesn't matter, especially when you're learning, just get a tip on it, just get it pointy. Get it pointy. I don't care if you're at a 25, a 30, a 35, whatever. It's all a little bit silly. Well, let's, let's see how well it performs at least. Power on. I do like that it came already assembled. Kind of nice. One thing you gotta be careful about is try not to wear out that one spot. I don't know. It puts a sharp point on there. I'll give it that. You know, and it comes with several replacement discs and it's not too bulky. It'll fit in a bag pretty all right. Still don't love it compared to my favorite method and I'll show you why. Now this is what I would prefer to use. I used to use just a regular grinding disc on there, kind of dedicate one to it. Uh, and I know some of y'all would be like, that's definitely not the way to sharpen tungsten on a grinding disc. And I could tell you a bunch of dudes and ladies out there in the field doing just that. It's a little bit savage for sure. This disc right here is under 20 bucks. And I love this little Welder's Republic spinner right here. So you can keep your fingers away from it and the heat off of it. That's really nice too. One of the biggest downfalls to this little grinder here is, you know, the holes that are meant for that 332. If you get just a little bit of a schmutz on your tungsten, you're not going to be able to put it through that hole without breaking that tungsten or cutting it or whatever you need to do. Whereas this has no holes and you kind of can be a lot more selective on your angle. That thing sharpened pretty all right outside of the fact that it won't sharpen an eighth inch tungsten. But for example, this uh, piece of 332 that we just sharpened, I just broke it square. Put some pressure, a little spin. A little sharp, fix your grinding marks. And I would say that is more of what I was looking for compared to what I got on the other end right here. But at the end of the day, you're just kind of limited to what this will give you compared to just kind of freestyling over here, which is kind of how I like to do my life. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to testing out this little portable welding machine. I feel like this is one of those too good to be true kind of situations. It comes with its own little carrying case. Wow. My favorite part of this welding machine is the pictures that they use to show it off. Like every one of them has definitely photoshopped this guy in here. It's got like pictures of TIG welds on there. Comes with a little welding lens. 
garbage. One of the little handheld welding hoods. Just absolute terrible gloves. Look at those things. Just like falling apart at the seam already. And we've got some handy dandy J422. I don't know what kind of electrodes those are. You get like 20 to 120 amps on here. Got us a little ground lead there and our plug. All right, let's throw a 6010 in it and see what happens. Let's try it. Okay, maybe we just max it out. 120 amps, it says. Oh. Oh. All right, I'm not messing with that anymore. Let's get rid of the 6010. Let's throw in one of these 7018s. Come on now. Light. The picture shows you welding a bunch of nice TIG welds, but you can't even put down a 7018. Come on. Let's try these little J422s, these Chinese rods. It looks a lot like, I don't know, maybe like a 6013. We'll see when we weld with it. Come on now. This is your rod. Oh. Oh! Gotta really finesse that arc. Come on, stay lit. Do your job. Yeah, that part looks a lot like a 6013. Does not like to stay lit unless you really finesse your arc length. Hey, it comes off too, slag peel. I've got some 6013s right here, so we should be able to light up no problem at 120 amps. These are not Chinese rods. These are, I think, Washington alloy, some quality stuff. I don't know, it doesn't really like this rod either. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and th say that this is a piece of junk. And let's try some more of the rods it came with. What happened? Oh, it's not plugged in. There we go. Thought she gave up on me already. It is really hard to hold, obviously. You gotta hold that certain angle and it, it's like kind of heavy. Super heavy. God, it smells so weird. I don't know what's in these electrodes. It's still running when it's unplugged. Interesting. Now I must admit this right here was running off a 50 foot extension cord. I'm not trying to give it any excuses, but maybe that might've been the reason why it's a piece of trash, but everything that itself and it came with is going in the garbage can. Maybe what isn't a piece of trash is this $30 welding hood. We got to MIG with it, it looked good under the hood. We did some stick welding just now, it looked fine under the hood. But what I always found with these machines is low amperage TIG usually gets them. But with the two sensors on there, if you get one of those two sensors blocked and they're not high quality, typically get flashed a little bit. So what I'm gonna end up doing is just lighten up on the side of this bell. I'm not gonna do much welding, but I'm gonna move my head around. And a good welding hood usually doesn't flash. Sensitivity's all the way up. So far, man, that's a good looking, good looking arc. We're about 50 amps right now. I'm turning the cup to where I'm blocking the arc completely. Kind of getting flashed, but as soon as I come around, it gets dark. Let's turn it down a little bit lower, like really low, like let's try like 30. Yeah, no, it's working. I'll be damned. Pretty much just fine. Now, well, I will admit it is floppy on my head now and I can't, I can't tighten it anymore. I'll tighten it without my head in there, but with my head in there, it don't get no tighter than that. If you could swap that out for some good stuff, that hood might last you a good while for just 30 bucks. You really can't beat it. Thanks for watching everyone. We'll see you on the next weld.